So on behalf of the organizing committee, a warm welcome to all the respected speakers and participants of the two days webinar on host micro interactions, present and future perspective, organized by the School of Biotechnology, Department of Life Science, Presidency University, Kolkata. We cordially invite today's speakers on the second and final day of the two-day webinar and look forward to an interesting and exciting series of scientific talks and interactions. So the first speaker is a great honor to welcome our first speaker of the session, Professor Kostov Shannal, known for his studies in molecular biology and genetics of pathogenic yeast such as Candida and Cryptococcus. He is a professor at the Molecular Biology and Genetics Unit of the Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research, Bangalore. He is also a visiting professor at the Osaka University, Japan, and an elected fellow of all three major Indian science academies, namely the Indian Academy of Sciences, the Indian National Science Academy, and the National Academy of Sciences India, as well as Guho Research Council India. He is also a fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology and a nominated faculty member of the faculty of 1000 UK. Professor Shannon is a recipient of various prestigious awards and honors, including the Tata Innovation Fellowship and the National Bioscience Award from the Department of Biotechnology India and an outstanding investigator award eukaryotic cell from the American Society for Microbiology. He has been an invited speaker to numerous international conferences organized by prestigious organizations like the Gordon Research Conference, EMBO, American Society for Microbiology, and Federation of European Biochemical Societies. He has more than 50 international publications, two book chapters, and one patent to his name. He has served as the associate editor of Frontiers in Cell and Infection Microbiology and a task force member of several national committees like the CSIR, ICMR, and DBT. Today, Professor Shannal will be delivering a talk on molecular innovations in rebuilding a load-bearing cellular machine. With this, I request Professor Shannal to start his talk. And Professor Shannal, for the convenience of the speakers, we will ring a bell uh, around uh, like three minutes prior to end of your talk. So may I request you to start? Thank you for kind uh, introduction. And I'm really honored to be invited to share our work in this uh, series of great talks. Uh, it's very nice to see the growth of life science department uh, presidency place with unending legacy and glamour that produced leaders in almost every field of life. Um, I'm also thankful for the faculty of life sciences at presidency to create a great learning atmosphere for especially for the undergraduate students. So it, can, it is, of course, good to see that a very strong post pathogen interactions group is uh, building up there. And I am just looking forward to visit uh, your place again in the next uh, immediate opportunity. <clears throat> so today I'll be talking about uh, the, the pathogen part because I, I don't really work on the host part. Um, uh, and I'll be focusing uh, on a molecular innovation uh, that probably rebuilds a cellular load bearing machine. Okay, let me just go to. Okay. So uh, you um, probably know that. Um, Everything started from a last eukaryotic common ancestor, which is called Lika. And one of the six lineages is Opisthokonta. Um, from where uh, the last common ancestor of all fungi would have come. 
Um, and there are several uh, different phyla, fungal phyla that uh, we know. Uh, some of them are not very clear, but uh, these are the major fungal phyla. And we know a lot about, not a lot, but quite a bit about Ascomycota, Basidiomycota, and Mucoromycota. So today I'll be um, focusing on um, an organism which is which belongs to the fungal phyla of Basidiomycota, uh, and it's called the Cryptococcus uh, neoformans. Okay, now the Cryptococcus uh, infections are on rise, and India is one of the hotspots of Cryptococcus infections. Worldwide, about 200,000 uh, deaths occur due to Cryptococcal meningitis. Uh, the most affected countries are some of the sub-Saharan countries, Africa, but India, as you can see, is also uh, uh, is quite a, uh, a hot spot for cryptococcus infection. Uh, it's an environmental pathogen which we uh, get by inhalation, uh, and we don't really know what are the uh, what are the reservoirs of this pathogen, but it has been shown that uh, the eucalyptus trees or pigeon guano. Um, uh, are um, probable sources of cryptococcus, uh, uh, cryptococcus are, are pro probable reservoirs of the cryptococcus uh, species. <clears throat> so we um, can inhale, and if we are uh, immunosuppressed, then uh, it can cause uh, pulmonary diseases, can also cross blood-brain barrier to, ca to cause cryptococcal meningitis. So now, uh, this is not a very, uh, you know, commonly used uh, uh, organism in the lab. So I thought that we'll just, I'll just introduce you to, uh, you know, the way we transform cryptococcus. We do some genetic manipulation of cryptococcus, so that some of you may be interested in working on this important fungal pathogen. <clears throat> so it has a, a thick cell wall and the capsule, so it's not easy to transform. So we use um, a machine called uh, uh, gene gun for biolistic transformation. So basically, uh, DNA uh, is uh, um, wrapped around gold beads, and then uh, we use this machine. And as you can see, that we create some pressure, and these gold beads are bombarded onto uh, the uh, plates, which have the untransformed or to be transformed cryptococcus cells. So we, so this is how we do it. So let's say this is a plate, an agar plate, from where we pick up a single colony, inoculate it, grow them, plate them. So these are untransformed uh, cells which are plated on a petri dish, um, and then we place this plate on this holder. Um, then we add gold beads, uh, but we place it somewhere here on the disc create pressure, and, uh, and then uh, basically this uh, pressure is created to uh, a certain level. And at that time, the disc ruptures, this disc ruptures, and the DNA is bombarded on the, on the plate. Yeah, yesterday I told one of my students to prepare this so that you get a real experience of how we do it. But I think he put a long video, so let's let it play. Um, so you can see the uh, pressure building up here. Now you can hold the pressure. And now you'll see that this is rupturing and the is bombarded. Yes, so that's how we transform. And then you can select the transformants, either uh, you know, depending on the technique you want to use by PCR, by certain blot analysis, or simply by microscopy, depending on what you're doing. So uh, that's how we do. Uh, so let's see, let's see what how chromosomes or the nuclear division occurs. 
in these organisms. So this is how we prepared a histone H4 tagged with, uh, tagged with the GFP. So, okay. Now we'll see how the chromosomes aggregate. So this is the nucleus. You don't see individual chromosomes. It moves to the daughter cell, which is quite unusual, and then it segregates its chromosome. Right. So now, um, if you really want to see how uh, exactly it happens, we collaborated with a Japanese group, and they have uh, given us really nice scans of uh, some of the electron micrographs. So as you see, here is the nucleus. Um, now there is a small bud that's going to appear from here. You can again see the nucleus here. It, it, it moves, um, as you see, towards the daughter cell. Uh, it, it moved further. And then um, at this point, you can actually see spindle. But what is unusual here, this is, this is the zoomed version of this. As you see here, that the nuclear envelope breaks down at this point from where the spindle appears. So uh, normally in yeast uh, species, you don't see nuclear envelope breaks down because they undergo closed mitosis. But this is an organism which uh, undergoes semi-open mitosis that we discovered. Now, how exactly uh, this uh, chromosome segregation takes place, which I have shown earlier, uh, has been modeled by uh, Raja Pal's group in, um, in Cultivation of Science in Kolkata, where we, could, we could show that you know, it, uh, the, it moves to the daughter cell, and then it actually segregates its chromosomes. And here we could actually um, uh, study the, what are the factors that are involved in this uh, process of chromosome segregation. You can basically manipulate one of the factors here and see how it affects chromosome segregation uh, uh, on the computer without actually doing the experiment and test whether that is true or not. Okay, <clears throat> so now uh, what we are trying to do is to find out if there is semi-open mitosis at exactly at what point the nuclear envelope ruptures. So you see here that PCNA is a nuclear protein and if nuclear envelope ruptures at certain point, then it should leak out. Um, but histone H4 is a chromatin-associated protein, so it should stay, and that should be the marker for the nucleus. Now, as you can clearly see that here, it leaks out. See, there is no green uh, uh, signal here, and then it comes back at certain point. So this is the time uh, you would expect the nuclear envelope uh, to be uh, broken down. As you see here, it's almost at the, at the same place uh, in the uh, electron micrograph as well. Okay, so this is a little unusual and that's where I, 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 I thought of sharing this information with you. So by looking at uh, 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 electron micrographs, our own cell biology experiments, we could uh, actually determine various stages of the cell cycle and the key events that might be happening here. As I said, one of the important things is uh, the nucleus moves to the daughter cell, uh, the nuclear envelope breaks down partially, and then chromosome segregation takes place. And these are the budding indices that are mentioned here, which uh, mark different stages of the cell cycle. Now, uh, for chromosomes to segregate, uh, uh, most of you know that we need uh, microtubules in form of spindle, and that interacts with the uh, uh, chromosomes at a place uh, which is called the centromere kinetochore complex, as you see here. So this is typically a metaphase stage where chromosomes are aligned at a metaphase plate, and then it segregates at anaphase. Although in most fungal species, there is no metaphase plate, uh, but the process of chromosome segregation occurs uh, a little differently. I'm not getting into that, but there is no uh, metaphase plate formation in, in fungi. 
So now uh, in today's talk, although most of my lab wor uh, works on, on the centromere evolution in different fungal species, uh, in this work we ventured out into the other end, which is the kinetochore complex. Now there are several proteins that form the kinetochore. There are two parts, inner kinetochore and the outer kinetochore. Uh, in the inner kinetochore, there are several proteins which are um, uh, always associated with the kinetochore, and that's why they are called uh, constitutively centromere associated network. And the outer kinetochore, we have uh, the, the KMN network, uh, which are listed here. Don't worry about the names. And here are the microtubules. So you can imagine the chromosome, you know, the chromatids are here, microtubules are here, and the, this is the interaction interface between the microtubules and the chromosome. Now, there has been uh, uh, you know, a lot of studies on uh, the, uh, the composition of this uh, kinetochore complex from yeast to humans. And uh, we see there is some amount of conservation that, that exists. But what is also um, uh, becoming clear that the conservation at the protein level is more towards the outer kinetochore than inner kinetochore. And the centromere chromatin or the centromere DNA is the most uh, rapidly evolving regions on the chromosomes. So um, now uh, how this outer kinetochore is uh, connected to the inner kinetochore uh, is uh, something that we have looked at in this um, project. Um, as you see that, uh, as I said, CCAN has many components. Uh, these are always associated with the, uh, the centromere DNA. And some of them are listed here. There are two uh, protein complexes. One is NPC and another is NPTWSX. So these are part of CCAN and they help um, uh, in connecting the centromere DNA to the outer kinetochore, as it has been shown here. This NPC, um, or it's called MIF2 in East, connects this outer, outer uh, kinetochore to the centromere DNA. This is one pathway. But what happens is there's a protein called DSN1 that gets um, phosphorylated, autophosphorylated, and this uh, weakens these interactions. At, at that point, you need another um, linker pathway, which is called the CNPT linker pathway, which also connects the inner to outer kinetic. So what is important to note here is these proteins are present at the inner kinetochore and they actually, these pathway stems from inner kinetochore and connects the outer kinetochore um, uh, in this uh, network. Okay, so I hope I'm clear till now. Now, uh, you know, what happened is that there are many, many fungal species which have been sequenced and assembled uh, uh, so one can really study the way these uh, any components, including the kinetochore um, components, evolved with time. Now here, uh, uh, what I'm showing is um, the, the, the kinetochore structure. You can see that these are the outer kinetochore components, these are inner kinetochore components, CNP and CNPC. And if they are present in each of these species, then they are shown in uh, green boxes. If they're absent, then they're in yellow boxes. And as you can see here, that many of these um, CCAN proteins, these proteins are absent uh, in a group of ascomycids, right? In a group of ascomycids, they are present and they, uh, they are absent and they are lost uh, multiple times during evolution, not once, but multiple times during evolution that are marked with these arrows. So, um, but they have DSN1. So if DSN1 is present, then you would expect that the CNPC pathway would be weakened, but there is no CNPT and many other CCAN proteins. Uh, how uh, this problem uh, could be managed is a question that we have asked in this project. So we chose Cryptococcus neoformans as an organism, which has lost um, CNPT, WSX complex, and many other proteins, but it has the CNPC linker pathway, but it also has DSN1. So, so this is the central question that we asked, that how the loss of CNPT uh, could be compensated 
uh, in these basidiomycid species, and we picked up Cryptococcus neoformans as an organism to answer this question. Now, um, so this is how the human uh, kinetochore microtubule interaction takes place. Uh, as I said, CNPC and CNPT are two major linker pathways uh, that uh, link the inner and the outer kinetochore, and here is the microtubule, depolymerizing micro microtubules that can pull the a chromosome to, uh, towards opposite poles at some point of time. Now here, um, these, uh, the dotted lines, the uh, dotted uh, lines, these, these subunits are missing, including SNPT. Uh, in Cryptococcus neoformans, which has quite long regional centromeres uh, uh, in all 16 chromosomes, uh, so the question that we ask is this, that how uh, this organism manages uh, this uh, DSN1 auto inhibition and loss of the SNPT pathway. Okay, so this work was entirely done by uh, uh, one of my graduate students, uh, Sreya Sridhar, who has just completed his uh, PhD and moved to uh, 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 Tax Fukagawa's lab, who was also a collaborator uh, uh, for this project. Uh, in fact, Sriyaj uh, went to uh, uh, Fukagawa lab to do several uh, experiments like mass spec and all, um, uh, and then he decided to join that lab. So uh, this is an unpublished work, and uh, I'm just going to describe to you how we have first identified the kinetochore interactome of Cryptococcus neoformans, which is believed to be different because many of these subunits are missing here. So what Sreyash has done is he picked up three um, components, flag tag them. These are the components that are present, flag tag them and pull down and did mass spec. And it worked so well that we could actually detect all the um, uh, proteins that are predicted to be present and kind of to code associated starting from CNP all the way to NDCIT, uh, as you see here. Be and, but our aim was to find something which would have compensated the loss of these proteins. So the next question is, are there undescribed kinetochore proteins uh, that are present in Cryptococcus neoformans? So we, we found some proteins which are actually basidiomycin specific kinetochore proteins. So we call them BKT1234 and so on. Now, uh, and we looked at their localization um, in the cell and you can see that Many other proteins are localized, but they are state specific uh, in their localization at the kinetochore. But one of them, which is we call the BKT1, uh, which is actually present on the other kinetochores. This, this is a protein which has kind of kinetochore exclusive localization. So, uh, and we called, called it bridging for some reasons, which will be obvious as, we, as I go along, the, along my talk. So we decided to work on this. Uh, then the next question is where does it localize? So inner kinetochore proteins are localized at the kinetochore throughout the cell cycle, but out, outer kinetochore proteins come and localize at certain point and then they, uh, then they uh, go away from the kinetochore uh, before the end of the cell cycle. So these are the inner kinetochore, these are the outer kinetochore proteins. So uh, there is a stepwise assembly here um, inner kinetochore proteins are localized throughout the cell cycle, outer kinetochore KMN network proteins, which are these, they appear here and then uh, they assemble and then go out. So, uh, so we wanted to study that what are the proteins that influence bridging localization, which is uh, denoted as BGI1. Um, so we have seen that if we treat with uh, microtubule depolymerizing drugs, then uh, the, the localization of uh, bridging is unaffected. Unaffected. Um, if we remove DAM1, if we deplete DAM1, it remains unaffected. Uh, so these are, they have no influence. But if we take KNL1, which is right here, uh, then we see about 30% drop in um, bridging uh, localization at the current uh, If we take, uh, if we deplete, uh, MIS-12 here, we see uh, almost undetectable level of bridging at the kinetochore. 
Now, uh, we also know that these proteins uh, actually influence each other, NDC80 and MIS12, and they influence CNPC and CNPA, so we did not test, obviously, because uh, if you deplete one of these, all they will be affected, and you'll see the same effect. So it looks like this outer connector code proteins are actually influencing localization of bridging at the connector code. So we looked at now that when bridging level uh, peaks at the kinetochore. So these are uh, every minute uh, he looked at the uh, signal intensity of the kinetochore in um, large number of cells. And you can see that it peaks at the uh, at anaphase stage of the cell cycle, as you see here. Uh, but most other kinetochore proteins, most, most other KNL1 um, or all, most other kinetochore proteins that we studied, for example, DAD1, which is a part of uh, uh, DAM1 complex and MIS12, they peak uh, at, um, which is shown in blue line, they peak at around um, uh, metaphase. So this is a little unusual that it peaks at anaphase uh, as opposed to metaphase, uh, but its localization is very similar to the outer kinetochore protein. It's not constitutively localized throughout the same cycle. Instead, it comes in G2 like the KMN protein, and then um, it, it goes away from the uh, kinetochore at around anaphase. Okay, so this tells us that uh, bridging is actually uh, uh, gets recruited at the kinetochore uh, at around G2, uh, and then it level uh, uh, peaks up at around anaphase, and probably this KMN network is uh, the receptor of this protein at the kinetochore. Um, so now I go to the next part, that what does it do? Uh, so we looked at the growth rate of BGI1 null cells. Uh, so BGI1 null cells are viable. So it's not an essential protein for cell viability, but it grows a little slowly. And uh, you can see uh, for wild type, the chromosomes segregate normally, and it takes about 22 minutes to segregate from the uh, beginning of uh, mitosis, which is marked here, as uh, remember that we actually determined the uh, beginning of mitosis. Uh, but if you look at the BGI1 null cells, then you can see that the chromosomes don't segregate properly. You can see lagging chromosomes or uh, improperly segregated nuclear mass here and there. And it also takes very long time. Uh, instead of 22 minutes, it takes 52 minutes or 64 minutes, very long time to complete mitosis. We do see about 15% uh, reduction in viability and about 90-fold increase in, uh, in the improper chromosome segregation in bridging mutants as compared to wild type. So the next question is how does it carry out its function? Um, so, um, uh, so now we looked at the different domains that are present here. Um, so it has an FHA domain. Uh, or forkhead associated domain, which is known uh, as phosphothionine uh, recognition domain. Um, then it has a long unstructured region and also a basic domain. The PI of the basic domain is very high, it's about 11.2, uh, which is almost like the histone fold domain. And, um, it, and of course, it has a, a FHA domain that's present. So, um, okay, so I'll skip this now. Um, so, Sriyash has constructed uh, several uh, versions of this bridging. This is full length, uh, and, and these are uh, this FHA domain deletion um, and basic domain deletion, then only uh, FHA domain, only basic domain, and only unstructured domain. And looked at that whether they are localized at the kinetochore or not. And we are quite intrigued to see that, uh, except the only basic domain, all other constructs, uh, although lacking some domains, the other, they are all actually localized to the kinetochore, but to a varying extent. Um, for example, if we uh, don't have the FHA domain, then it's reduced, its localization uh, intensity is reduced, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, they are localized, but not always to the level of the wild type level. 
Um, so now the question is, although they're localized, is it are, are these constructs sufficient for function? So he tested. Now we knew that wild type can grow well at 14 degree or in presence of a microcosm, uh, thiobendazole at 4 microgram per ml. But bridging mutants cannot uh, are sensitive to cold temperature as well as uh, thiobendazole. Now we actually um, complemented with the full length construct, and now you, you can see that it complements nicely. So if we have a feature domain deletion which is localized uh, uh, to the kinetochore, it, it starts showing defects, as you see here. If you don't have the binding domain, then you can see that it doesn't complement. All of them are localized. Uh, only um, uh, FHA domain, only USD, they localize, but they don't complement. Uh, but if you have the bridging, uh, the, the BD only, uh, then of, of course it doesn't localize, it doesn't complement. All right, so now uh, the summary of this part is if we don't have uh, bridging, then we see uh, segregation defects, growth deficiencies. Now, um, these are the uh, different domains which are uh, the full length is, that, is one that is required for full complementation. Uh, but if we have either FHA domain or USD, then it can actually uh, uh, can be recruited at the kinetochore, but we don't see any uh, complementation. Okay. Now, um, so this part is how this is happening. How much time do I have? Uh, uh, was the, yeah. So, yeah. Mr. Shannon, uh, you have like three minutes more. Okay. All right. So, um, so now uh, what we are trying to understand is how much time, how much, uh, I mean, how does uh, BD uh, um, function in this bridging? Because even if you don't have BD, um, uh, it, it can localize, but it, it doesn't complement the function. Uh, and because of its uh, very high basic nature, we think that it may be required for its interaction with DNA. But this is, as you remember, this is an outer kinetic property. So what was done here is to see that whether uh, we could see um, some sort of um, um, gel mobility shift uh, by taking uh, a construct uh, which does, which has uh, the BD and which does not, uh, and which has the full length. And we can see that the BD is, is sufficient to actually um, uh, uh, move uh, or, or shift the DNA. So this means that whether it's H3 uh, nucleosome or CNPA nucleosome, this is H2 nucleosome, this is CNPA nucleosome, can actually, BD, is, uh, BD alone can actually show um, uh, gel mobility shift, which suggests that this basic domain is involved in chromatin interaction. Thank you, I heard it. Uh, so yes. yes. So now, um, uh, so we decided to see whether if we can swap the binding domain of uh, BD, uh, uh, binding domain of bridging with a binding domain of similar PI of another protein. So uh, we chose KI67, which is a human protein, which also has an FHA domain. So uh, and we constructed a chimeric protein where BD is from. Uh, a KI67, and we checked whether that works or not. And what we see is <clears throat> that, um, uh, okay, these are the controls, and what we are looking at, whether it can pull down histone H4 or not. So um, if you see here, if I don't have BD, then there is no pull down of uh, uh, histone H4, but if I have BD, a deletion plus KI67, then it can pull down uh, histone H4, which suggests that even the chimeric protein uh, can work. And the same uh, uh, sample, we isolated DNA and see that, in fact, the centromere is enriched with this chimeric protein, which suggests that uh, this uh, can actually work 
um, this chimeric protein can work, which means the Ki67 binding domain can actually complement the loss of BD of bridging. Um, in fact, it can also complement the function of uh, uh, bridging. So uh, this is the final uh, uh, model where we show that uh, at G2, bridging comes and uh, binds to the kinetochore, the outer kinetochore, and then it interacts with the inner kinetochore uh, and helps in bridging force propagation. How this is different from uh, the other linker proteins that I talked about, SNP and SNPT? These linker proteins are the other conventional linker proteins actually are present at the inner kinetochore and then it connects the outer kinetochore. So they are first recruited at the inner kinetochore and helps in connecting the outer kinetochore, but bridging is just the other way. And it's also uh, clear that. Uh, it has uh, more ancient roots because not only it's present in fungi, it's also present in metazoa, in amoeba. Uh, so we know that it's present at least here, but we still don't know whether it's present in the last eukaryotic common ancestor or not. Uh, this is my lab. Uh, all this work was done by Shreyash. Uh, these are the other lab members. Some of them uh, are going to go because they have just submitted their thesis or just graduated. Some of them are gone from this uh, image. And thanks for your attention. I am happy to take any questions. Thank okay. you, uh, Professor So may I request uh, the moderator of the session to start the question and question. Do you want me to answer? Yeah. Uh, Okay, Dr. Sannal, uh, thank you for the fantastic talk. I will quickly ask question from the audience here in the Google Meet uh, session. Okay, so uh, is, there, is, is there anybody here who has question? Yeah, Shubhapa, please. Uh, yes, uh, I have. Yeah. Uh, so it was a very interesting talk, Professor Shanmar. I just have a couple of questions. Uh, firstly, uh, what is this? Uh, what is the significance of uh, this? Uh, the entire uh, nucleus moving into the daughter cell prior to segregation um, that you observed in this uh, cryptococcus, and what is also the significance of um, having the semi-open um, mitosis, which is very unusual thing that you observed in cryptococcus. And the third question that I have is regarding the bridging, which you said is a basidiomycetes uh, specific, and chromatin is the rapidly evolving uh, domain. But still, we see that the chimeric protein, which has a human uh, binding domain, is able to bind and uh, uh, bind to the chromatin of uh, the cryptococcus that you tested. So, what is uh, kind of the significance? Okay, um, several questions. Okay. Um, so, uh, regarding this um, uh, movement of nucleus to the daughter cell, so usually what happens is in Saccharomyces cerevisiae and other Ascomycetes uh, yeast, uh, the nucleus moves near the mother daughter bud junction and then it, it segregates. Here we see that it completely moves to the daughter cell and then it segregates. And that is also true in another basidiomycetes species, which is called Pistilagomyces. Now, but it is not really a specific phenomena because we also looked at uh, uh, Malastasia species where we don't think that it actually moves to uh, 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 the daughter cell and then it segregates. Now, we don't know the significance of why it has to do that, but uh, with uh, uh, Raja Paul's group, what we uh, found out is that the amount of the concentration of dynein or the number of cytoplasmic microtubules determine whether this chromosome segregation will take place in the mother bud junction or should it move to the daughter cell and segregate. We still don't know the physiological relevance of this. Regarding semi open mitosis, we just observe that it, it undergoes semi-open mitosis, and there are other examples of semi-open mitosis. Uh, but uh, if it is not semi-open, what would happen? We don't know. We still don't know. 
um but these are all on such questions uh, regarding uh, the complementation of uh, the human protein uh, uh, dna binding domain with uh, um, the kind of uh, the bridging in bd um it only tells us that that the that the sequence or the motif uh, is not important but this positively charged residue is very important so if we have a net positive charge which can interact with the dna then it doesn't matter what is the source of it but it still works in other words if we just take bd and over express the protein in in the cell then we see that it goes and binds all over chromatin so it is the specificity doesn't come from bd the specificity okay. that it localized on the the nucleus comes from its interaction to the outer kinetochore and then it, it actually localizes only to uh, the inner kinetochore okay thank you thank you very much okay dr sanal uh, in regard to this this uh, what shugopa asked i also have a quick question on that so i'm just wondering if you think it is uh, it is a possibility that uh, due to this uh, semi open mi mitosis the astral microtubules unlike in cerebici the astral microtubules or the spb is actually stabilized uh, by a protein by a protein which is localized in the daughter cell only at the start when it goes into the daughter, daughter cell so the from uh, from the membrane of the daughter cell some kind of uh, Uh, astral microtubule stabilizing protein probably localized at the at the position which is opposite to the bud neck is it a possibility like in row c or something that is seen sometimes seen in uh uh cerebici uh, this is a uh, this is a very um, interesting question uh, uh, and the possibility um, we have looked at how monorotine uh, is for one in east how it controls um uh, this chromosome segregation in cryptococcus uh, and then we stumbled upon uh, 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 proteins which are actually interacting with uh, the same part plus and binding protein mm -hmm. uh, and they are uh, uh, so for example uh, carnitine and beam one these proteins uh, interact with the um, cortex now what we What we think is happening is that for this movement of the nucleus uh, in the uh, daughter cell, for this timely movement of the nucleus to the daughter cell, which is extremely important, that probably happens because of um, the focus nucleation of the microtubules to uh, to, uh, to the uh, cortex. So if for example the microtubules and actually the astral microtubules can come out in all directions but the time it takes for this process uh, if it goes if it is not focused to one particular place in the cell cortex if it goes all over then it takes a very very long time at this competition and it takes a very long time to move these nucleus from mother cell to the daughter cell so we think that uh, there is some collaboration between the the plasma and astral microtubules that is the cell cortex that plays an important role but i what i did not mention here in my talk is unlike saccharomyces cerevisiae here there are several um uh, microtubule organizing centers or mtocs that are present in the beginning of the cycle um and then as cells enter mitosis all these mtocs coalesce to form a single spindle pole body so so there is an additional requirement here to to bring all the um, uh, all the mtocs together in one spb which is a very unusual uh, case in uh, in in uh, in cryptococcus but that's not true in the saccharomyces cerevisiae where you see always one spb which duplicates in rise to two spb Yep. Okay. That's. Uh, I think that's a very have, uh, interesting model. Yep. Yeah. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sarnal, for this wonderful talk. Uh, I have a couple of questions too. So, for my first question is, uh, what are the parameters uh, that may determine uh, which mitotic mechanisms are required uh, for the contribution in uh, to evolution? 
Um, so uh, the question is uh, whether uh, it will go through a, a open mitosis, semi-open or closed yes. mitosis? Yes, yes. The question? Yes. Yes, OK. Um, yeah. I don't know. So uh, I mean, there were various modes of mitosis. Um, but uh, you know, I don't know how it is determined. But we don't have examples of a semi-open or open mitosis in Ascomycota. We just see that there is um, semi-open mitosis in uh, some species of um, Basidiomycota. Actually, I take back my word. There is there, there is a, a species of uh, fission yeast which actually shows uh, uh, semi-open mitosis. So I don't know what actually determines whether it should go through um, semi-open, open, or closed mitosis. Uh, and it's also a kind of a debate. Uh, you know, people who work on the nuclear membrane dynamics, they, they think that the word semi-open and open uh, uh, or closed are not the right words. It's just, you know, we may not have the ability to detect whether there is uh, a nuclear membrane rupture in apparently closed mitosis. So, uh, you know, uh, we don't know that closely on the uh, nuclear membrane, but that's what I have heard people talking that, you know, there may be semi open mitosis or nuclear membrane rupture in all, um, in all uh, organisms. So, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shannal, for the sake of time and for the technicalities for the next talk. Uh, I have to. Uh, all for an end, although it was very exciting and I would love to listen to you for, you know, for maybe a, a, one more uh, hour. Uh, so, but I guess we will, uh, will you know, be in touch uh, with you. Uh, so I, uh, once again, I thank you uh, for this fantastic and exciting talk that it will, you know, around, like a lot of questions we have, but probably we'll talk to you later. And we have to, uh, you know, uh, come for an end for this session. So thank you once again, and I'll I'll call uh, this session as an end. Thank you. Thank you all. Yep.